think that's everybody connected. Cool. Hi. Hello, everyone. And welcome to today's lunchtime talks put on by your friendly East Midlands branch of the Royal Society of Biology. My name is Mark Vastanavant and I am the vice chair. I am also a teacher of biology at Uppingham School. I have a couple of students coming today and they will be watching the recording later on as well. So thank you very much to our guest, Gareth Starbuck. I'll hand over to Rosemary Hall, our secretary, who will talk us through. Just a very brief introduction to Gareth and we need to get going. Um, pleased to see everyone um, come in today, some new people, some that have been with us um, for previous talks as well. So welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Gareth Starbuck. He is at Nottingham Trent University and he is um, head of the department in the School of Animal, Rural and Environmental Sciences. Over to you, Gareth. Thank you, Rosemary, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've been asked to give a, a brief introduction to me to start off with, um, just out of interest, and I suppose um, certainly when I was in sixth form and thinking about careers as a biologist, um, I was always keen to know what other people did and how they got to where they did. Um, so a brief potted history of my background. Um, I started as a frustrated veterinary surgeon um, that couldn't get into vet school, as I think a number of animal biologists do. And, um, and then trying to get into vet school, I decided to do a degree in um, animal physiology, which I did at Nottingham University, and fell in love with animal physiology. Um, and then ended up in the really awkward situation of having an offer at vet school um, and, and then an offer of a funded place on a PhD at Nottingham. Uh, so I, I decided on the PhD and uh, I pursued a career in um, reproductive physiology. So I did work on um, course reproduction initially. My PhD was on uh, improving fertility in dairy cows. Um, and then I did some postdoctoral work at Nottingham before moving to Nottingham Trent University and uh, steadily worked my way up from senior lecturer right through to head of department. And as I've done that, my interests in research have kind of grown. Um, so as I've moved up through the department and I've de de um, developed collaborative links, my kind of diversity of interests in, in research have, have grown quite widely, but are always based in physiology. So that's my background. Um, and for those of you out there that are wanting a career in veterinary medicine and don't get the opportunity to go to vet school, uh, don't give up hope is my advice. Um, there's actually some great careers in science that aren't veterinary medicine. So I'm head of department now at the School of Animal, Equine and uh, Veterinary Sciences. And um, my talk today is really to um, give you an introduction to a, a project that's really come out of collaboration through a number of partners and, and, and really resulted out of, out of a chance situation, but hopefully has led to great successes. And um, what I'm wanting to use it for really is to give you an overview of um, uh, genetics and how we're linking genetics to conservation and how we've brought this um, a, a group of people that can contribute various aspects of reproduction and genetics and conservation together uh, to try and um, improve the uh, conservation and breeding opportunities for animals. So when we think about conservation um, and conservation related to animals, I think our minds kind of wander to endangered species, but conservation is about the preservation of resources. And, um, and when we think about those resources, particularly in animals, we start to realize that conservation isn't just about endangered wild species, um, actually, it has uh, application to the domestic situation as well. 
And that can be rare breeds, so we have rare breeds, but we also have um, horse, uh, animals in breeds, and breeds themselves cause problems. And I'm, I'm, I'll, I will illustrate that through this talk, how when we start to segregate animals into different bits, into different populations, we start to cause uh, problems for ourselves. So this project really is, is born out of the idea that we have um, domesticated animals that we put into these groups that we call breeds. And for one reason or another, the, the need for these breeds has fallen out of favour. But what we want to do is hang on to the, the resource that's contained in them. Um, all of these animals are essentially a genetic resource and they could be valuable for us for the future. And so um, just like wild animals, there's this uh, interest in preserving them. And our involvement really came through um, it being highlighted to, to me and the research group that I work in that uh, there was an issue with heavy horses. So um, heavy horses were the, um, were the muscle of agriculture and industry um, initially. And at the peak, um, there were 26 million horses estimated in the UK being engaged in some form of industry. Their numbers declined, and they declined as a result of mechanization and also because horses were conscripted into, um, into the war, um, particularly in World War I. And so we lost a significant number of horses, particularly of the heavier breeds, as a result of that. The problem with these kinds of events is that they're um, indiscriminate. So what they're doing is they're having an impact on the population. If you're a farmer and you've got some horses and you use them to work your land and you buy a tractor and you don't need the horses anymore, you either sell the horses or the horses um, go to the knacker man and, and so their genetics disappears. There's no preservation of those genetics. So what we have is a population that was very large and suddenly it's become very small or they were killed in war. Um, so we've had this, this big shrinking in the size of this population. And the, the breeding that goes on afterwards, so the remaining population gets bred, but it's bred out of an interest in what the animal looks like or how it performs, but not, not necessarily giving regard to its genetics. And this is of great concern. So what, what we're seeing here is a situation that is creating this classic example of inbreeding that starts to uh, cause problems with, um, with animals. And our interest in this was drawn in through um, a breed of horse called the Suffolk Punch. And the Suffolk Punch is probably the oldest breed of heavy horse that, um, that is represented in the same way that it was originally bred and fashioned originally. Um, and it's a heavy horse. It was mainly used in farming and forestry work. And like I say, it followed this story of not being required in agriculture anymore, impacted by um, the conflicts of World War I and the involvement of horses in that, and uh, reduced to a, a situation now where there are less than 75 mares in the UK. There are less than 300 mares in the world. Um, foal registrations are really low. Um, they've been as low as uh, in the 1980s, the lowest was six foals registered. Uh, last year there were 12. Um, so foal registrations are really low. And the biggest problem with this animal is it's a horse. And um, the reason I say that is because the horse is a seasonal breeder. It can only produce one offspring at a time and its generation interval is really long. So if we want to do something about recovering an animal like a horse, we've got to think in a bit more of an inventive way about how we do it. And the reason we got involved was because here at Nottingham Trent University, we rescued a um, Suffolk Punch mare. And at the same time, we were doing some collaborative work with um, 
probably the leading horse uh, technology breeder in the country, Stallion AI Services. Um, so we've got a number of research projects and PhD students um, doing research with them. And we started to talk about potential for other projects. At the same time, we were in contact with the Rare Breed Survival Trust, and we were interested in some of the work that they were doing um, with uh, um, rescuing different breeds, but uh, particularly horses. And there was kind of this perfect moment where we'd got a horse, there was an interest in preserving it. We didn't really know how endangered the Suffolk horse was, but it started that conversation. And we sat around a table at Stallion AI Services and started to dream up a way in which we could do something about preserving this particular breed. Other people that were involved were Cogent. Cogent is a cattle breeding company and their specialism is in uh, sexing uh, uh, bull semen to, um, to separate out the X chromosome and Y carry uh, Y chromosome carrying sperm. Um, and obviously that we, we'd had involvement and, and funding from the Suffolk Course Society. So there was kind of this perfect storm of the right people coming together at the right time with the right science and the right ideas and generating a project. But before I progress with that any further, I just want to make sure that um, some of the concepts of genetics that underpin this project are understood. So the next few slides will just be going through what hopefully for A-level biology is, is familiar information, but um, I'll go through it and, and just describe it from the perspective of this project. <clears throat> so the first concept that I want to talk about is um, genetic bottlenecking. And genetic bottlenecking is um, a, a situation that occurs when the population suddenly gets challenged. And it's called bottlenecking because the, the, this slide shows the analogy. You've got a bottle, it's full of different colored balls. Those balls are representing the genetic diversity of that population, but something challenges that population. And the challenge is essentially trying to empty some balls out of the neck of that bottle and some of them get captured. And the ones that get captured are the surviving population. So this is a nice analogy for what's happened to heavy horses and in particular the Suffolk horse. So we have an original population, it's farming, it's been developed and bred to farm. The population is nice and large and its genetic diversity is nice and diverse. So this is a healthy population of horses. And then mechanization happens, World War I happens, people can't afford to keep horses anymore, and so the population rapidly diminishes to a small surviving population. And what this diagram shows is that the surviving population through that selection may not represent what the original population looked like due, from a genetic point of view. And that's shown a bit more clearly in, in this slide. So in this slide, um, we, we have the composition of the genetic population on the left-hand side, and you can see the percentage uh, uh, composition of different colored balls in the beaker on the left-hand side. And then we go through a selection process of letting a few balls out of that um, uh, initial population. And then we let those populate themselves. So we breed those with their, with their new genetic um, uh, uh, constituents. And what we end up with is a new population on the right-hand side. And you'll see from the distribution of different colors that the, the distribution is different. So that event has changed things quite dramatically. And this is what happens when we breed breeds. Um, the, the diagram here is a diagrammatic representation of, of the domestication of horses. And the assumption is that horses were diverse, greatly diverse, populated Europe and Asia, um, 
and some of those horses uh, became extinct. Some of those horses were not of use to humans. Um, some of them were driven out by humans populating the land. And so groups of horses got selected and domesticated on their ability to become domestic. And, and so we started to select the horse. So what we're doing is taking a huge population of interbreeding animals that are, are populating a huge area, and we're reducing them down already to a population where we're selecting the group based on its genetics. And what that results in is something called genetic drift. So genetic drift is when a population goes from being large to small, and through random selection events, us deciding what horses we want to breed and what breeds we want those horses to be in and what jobs we want them to do, start to select horses. We select based on phenotype, what the horse actually looks like, but what we're doing through that process is we're restricting the diversity of genes in that remaining population. So over time, we start to change the genetic composition of, of those animals. The problem with bottleneck events when they're extreme is that they really significantly drop the population size. And when you drop the population size, you have this big impact on genetic diversity. So you lose genes, you lose um, alleles. Some of the alleles at particular loci could be dominant and recessive, and they could occur with equal frequency in the population. You could have a population for um, most um, loci in, in their genome being heterozygous and heterozygosity, having, having a, a dominant allele and a recessive allele is considered to be a healthy genetic situation. What we do when we reduce the size of a population is we reduce the genetic diversity. And so you can see from this graph that after the bottleneck event, we get this catastrophic fall in population size, but with it, we also get this fall in, in genetic diversity. And from that point, there are really two options. We can either see recovery or extinction. And which way those, that, that goes is dependent on, on a few things. The size of the population that remains is a key one and how genetically diverse that population is that remains is, is also key. But then if that population can survive, it needs the random events of mutation to start to replenish the genetic diversity in the remaining population. So when we get these catastrophic falls in population size, we need to be really careful about what we do when we breed these animals because if we breed them the wrong way, we will reduce the genetic diversity in the population. And that will push the animals towards extinction. <clears throat> and this, this concept of, of extinction is kind of highlighted in this diagram here. So when we have small populations, we see inbreeding, and we see genetic drift. So the genetic composition of the population starts to move in a particular direction. Because of that, we lose genetic variability. And genetic variability is, the, is really the ability of a population to respond to challenge. If, if a population was genetically the same and it was affected by the same environmental challenge, Extinction is inevitable because there isn't, the, there isn't the breadth of potential genetically for that population to respond. So what we want is, is a, an appropriate level of genetic diversity in the population that when it's challenged, there'll be some individuals that have the genes to survive. So genetic diversity is, is, is what gives the population that ability to respond to challenge. 
What we see in animals when they lose genetic variability is things start to happen to, to the individuals in that population anyway. So we see a reduction in fitness, in, in their vigor, their ability to thrive and survive. They become more susceptible to diseases. We see that their reproductive potential starts to fall and we get higher mortality rate in that population. And eventually it starts to spiral down through a smaller population where these problems get exacerbated and eventually results in extinction. So this is what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid these limited populations ending up into this, in this downward spiral towards extinction. <clears throat> so a bit about population size. Why is, why is population size important? Well, if you've got a population of 50 individuals, so on the left here, I've, I've shown we have a population of 50 individuals. If we lose 10 of those individuals through a chance event, we've lost a fifth of the population. And those animals that we lose could have significant genetic makeup that's important to the genetic diversity of that population and the ability of that population to survive. If the original population is bigger, like on the right hand side, and we have 500 individuals, in this situation, if we still lose those 10 individuals through this random event, we've only, used, we've only lost a 50th of the population. And so the impact on the population is smaller. And so the, the, the chance of losing important genes is, is more reduced. And so the resulting population is more likely to be genetically similar to the original population. So this is why population size is really important. If we, if we reduce the size of the population, it's more susceptible to impacts from the environment and impacts from the change in the size of that population. But from a reproductive point of view and a genetic point of view, when we're breeding animals, we don't just count the animals and say that's the population size. What we're interested in when we're breeding animals is how many of those animals are actually breeding every year and producing offspring. And also, are they able to breed in the ideal conditions that we would like to maintain the genetic diversity of that population? So on the left, ideal populations are infinitely large. Their matings are completely random. There's no selection going on. All individuals can contribute equally to the next generation, and we don't get overlapping of generations. So we've really got this um, kind of utopia of breeding that prevents inbreeding. And this is ideal, it never happens. In real populations, as I've got on the right-hand side, we have a restricted population size. We have unequal sex re ratios. Some of those sexes may not be bred as frequently as others. So in horses, we're much more likely to breed mares because we need offspring, but particular stallions could get selected for. And so the male contribution becomes reduced and we have a few males that are contributed to the next generation. We also have unequal family sizes. Um, selection happens. We have a preference for the animals that we breed together and generations also overlap. So we end up breeding related individuals together. And so that has an impact on the population that starts to reduce genetic diversity. And this is one of those problems with any population. When we breed a population, we inevitably reduce its genetic diversity because we're breeding individuals together that have some level of relatedness at one level or another. And people have looked at this, people have looked at the impact of population size on the chance of losing, um, losing a population. And, um, out of the literature comes this 5500 rule. And the 5500 rule essentially says that in order to immediately save a population, you need an effective population size of 50. So that's 
50 animals that are breeding it towards that idealistic route and are actually contributing to the next generation. But if we want the population to survive in the long term, we need a population, an effective population size of 500 individuals. So you can see when I was introducing at the beginning that our Suffolk horse has only got 75 breeding females registered in the UK, we're starting to deal immediately with a situation that gives us great concern. And I've already mentioned that when you breed horses, you lose genetic variation. And when we get down to small population sizes, the amount or the percentage of that genetic variation that gets lost is quite significant. So if the effective population size is 100, as, as shown in the table, we, for every generation, we lose 0.5% of the genetic variation from that population. And you can see how those figures ramp up the smaller the population size is. Now this is where being a horse is beneficial because horses have a generation interval of about 10 years. So the rate of loss is slow. It gives us some thinking time. And this is where this kind of research project comes in. So we can't stop the loss of genetic diversity, but what we can do is we can inform breeding choices to, to arrest it. Just a bit about genetic drift for, because um, I've mentioned genetic drift and I've not really illustrated it. So for the benefit of that, um, I'll illustrate it. Uh, what we're interested in with genetic drift is changing the allelic frequency of the population. And the diagram here shows a, a group of bugs and there's diversity in this group of bugs. And if you select certain populations to breed the next generation, you can see how the selection starts to change what the resulting population looks like. So if you're only selecting for the top population individuals that are brown or have yellow markings, out of that initial population, you end up with a new population where they're all brown with yellow markings and the red individuals and the orange individuals disappear. If you're more diverse in your selection, then you can still retain a level of diversity, but you'll see in the population below, the brown individuals have disappeared. So selection starts to, to drift animals in a direction away from the original population based on their genetics. And what we lose is some of that genetic diversity. And we could lose beneficial alleles, or what we could do is start to fix alleles that are detrimental. And a lot of detrimental alleles that kind of lurk in the background are homozygous recessive. So when we breed individuals together in smaller groups in a close way, we start to breed carriers together, individuals that are heterozygous. And if we breed heterozygous individuals together, um, we have this 25% chance of producing offspring that become homozygous recessive. And I like to illustrate that by um, using a spanner. And um, the spanner analogy is um, about the usefulness of, of allelic diversity. So the top spanner is a really useful spanner. Um, it's really useful because it has two potentials to be used. It's got two ends, but one end is different from the other. So it's got two different sizes. So this spanner can do two jobs. If I need a big spanner, I've got one end. If I need a small spanner, I've got the other end. So I only need one tool to do the job. The two spanners underneath are um, homozygous. We've got a homozygous dominant spanner that's got two big ends, and we've got a homozygous recessive spanner that's got two little ends. And both of them only do one job. The top one only unders big nuts, and the bottom one only unders little nuts. So from a, a genetic perspective, what we like to see is lots of heterozygosity in a population. Um, and anybody that um, breeds animals knows that if you take two breeds and you breed them together to produce a hybrid, um, what you get is hybrid vigor. You get an individual that lives longer, 
um, that is healthier, that doesn't have genetic diseases as frequently, um, and so the individual is fitter genetically. And insurance companies know that. If you've got a mongrel dog and it's a first generation mongrel dog, the chances are your insurance policy will be lower than if you've got a pedigree um, dog that has lots of genetic diseases associated with that, with that, um, that breed of dog. So we need to maintain a level of allelic diversity as well as what the animal looks like. We're interested in genes. The problem with producing breeds is that we are defining populations of animals. We're saying, here's this group of animals, we're going to put all the animals into this group, and from this day forwards, we're not allowing any more animals in. So we've already restricted the, the size of the gene pool, the original gene pool for, for those animals. So this breed is all, this breed has actually created genetic restriction. And from that point onwards, we breed with those individuals and they become more genetically related. And as they become more genetically related, we start to see things emerge. So as we look at pedigree animals, when we breed pedigree animals, we see problems emerge. Um, Labradors get hip dysplasia and so do German Shepherd dogs. Uh, Dalmatians are susceptible to all sorts of kidney diseases. In fact, there are veterinary books that are very large that contain all of the genetic diseases of pedigree dogs. You start to look at horse breeds, really inbred horse breeds, and they start to have problems. Some of them struggle to carry pregnancies. Some of them have um, uh, tendon problems and ten tendon injuries and those kinds of things. So the result of, of um, um, this inbreeding is that we start to um, increase relatedness and we create inbreeding depression. We can measure that by looking at something called mean kinship. So this is a measure of how related an individual is to the entire population. And in populations that have large amounts of genetic diversity, um, we see that individuals aren't that related to the remaining population. Where mean kinship is high, um, we've got high levels of inbreeding. So, so this gives us a measure of how inbred um, an animal population is. And we can relate that to how related we might be. So in this table, I've got siblings. Siblings are 25% inbred. They have common parents. And so their kinship is 50%. Cousins, cousins have, um, they're related by one of their parents, and so they have an inbreeding of 12.5%, of uh, a kinship of 25%. But if we look at some of the horse breeds, the thoroughbred horse isn't far off um, being the same as almost breeding cousins together. And the Cleveland Bay horse, one of our heavy horses, isn't that far away from breeding siblings. So when we talk about relatedness in animals, we're not saying that they're, they're actually siblings or they're actually cousins. We're saying that the population is that closely related to its distant ancestry that we've lost the diversity and we're almost breeding a family together, even though we don't consider them to be um, siblings or, or cousins. So it's their genetic relatedness. And this is where pedigree comes in. So we can use this information. If we could measure how related the living individuals were to their pedigree, we could then give a measure of um, genetic diversity. But through that, we could then spot individuals that we should breed together that wouldn't reduce the genetic diversity of the population quite as much. So pedigrees are really useful. And that's the nice thing about horse breeds they keep pedigree. So every horse that's bred together, a record is made of it. And when pedigrees are more than 10 generations deep and the data records are really robust, so they're recorded really accurately, this becomes a really useful resource for us um, measuring what's happening to horses and potentially advising breeders. And at this point, I introduce Andy Dell. Andy Dell 
works for the Rare Breed Survival Trust. He did his PhD in this area. He's devoted to a heavy horse breed called the Cleveland Bay and um, breeds Cleveland Bay horses himself and realized that the Cleveland Bay was in trouble. So if we look at the inbreeding of the Cleveland Bay, we can see that since um, the 1930s, this horse has become increasingly related and, and is moving towards a position where it's in danger of, of that extinction vortex. And what Andy wanted to do was, was come up with a way in which he could help breeders be more informed about which stallions and mares he bred together. So there are a number of options. You can divide the population up and, and keep different parts of the breed apart. You can randomly mate horses, although that's a really bad idea. Um, and often breeders don't want to do that anyway. They're very precious about which stallions they breed their mares to. Or what we can do is give them information about how related their horses are to the rest of the population. And what Andy did was take some software um, called Sparks, which is used in the zoo industry, and applied that to the Cleveland Bay horse. So essentially, he's digitized all of the pedigree records for the Cleveland Bay horse. And every single year, he updates that and he gives breeders an indication of which stallions they should breed their mares to that would reduce the amount of inbreeding that's going on in the breed. And this is really easy for, for mare owners. So mare owners now submit to the Cleveland Bay Horse Society their mare's name. They say they want to breed their horse. And what, what happens is they're given back um, a, a list of stallions that are coded by green, amber, uh, orange, or red, and they're encouraged to breed their um, green matches together. So these are horses that have similar kinship, um, so they're not going to damage the genetic diversity of the population by breeding them together, or at the very worst, they can breed with a, a yellow, uh, an amber horse, because that has a, a, a minimum impact, it's a, it's a neighboring kinship group. So now these breeders, rather than breeding randomly, can say, OK, well, give me the list of stallions. And then from that list of stallions, I'll pick the one that fits best. So rather than randomly picking any old stallion, they're now picking the stallions that are going to have least damage on the genetics of the population moving forwards. And did it work? Yes, it did. So. Um, the very last 15 years of, um, of this chart show that that, that um, really steep curve moving upwards on the left hand side has leveled out. And that's a result of sparks. That's a as a result of informing the breeders which stallions they should be breeding their mares to. And as a result of that, what it started to do is positively impact on the effective breeding, uh, uh, effective population size of, of this breed. So not only have we seen a halting of, of the um, decrease in genetic diversity, but we've also, through this process, increased the effective population size by giving the breed more individuals to breed from and that are actively engaging in the breeding process. So back to our Suffolk Punch. Our Suffolk Punch um, is, is a small population. It's smaller than the Cleveland Bay. Um, and it's been bred in a random way. And it's inbreeding, is following a pattern that's very similar to that of the Cleveland Bay. So it's, it's, it's on an upward traje trajectory. And this horse is heading seriously towards extinction if nothing's done about it. And this is where we started working with Andy. So we helped Andy with the digitization of, of the um, uh, Suffolk Horse Society's pedigree records and uh, started to gather information out of those records for our particular mare. We were interested in breeding our mare. And what we got for our, our mare, Ruby, was this list of uh, potential stallions. 
And from that, we could pick a stallion to breed our mare with. We felt that we needed to add to this contribution into the next generation. But the Suffolk horse population is really small, and the number of mares is really small. So we've got to do something to increase the breeding potential in the future. And this was where the gathering of science really started to play a part. So we'd identified a, a stallion, but if we're going to breed this mare and invest in this, there's a 50-50 chance of producing a filly foal, producing a female. And we need a female to boost our future breeding population. And we wanted to guarantee that a bit more. So that's where Stallion AI Services came in. This is Tullis Matson. he's the director of Stallion AI Services, and he's passionate about saving these heavy horses. He doesn't want to see them disappear. And he said, well, why don't we have a go with sexing the semen just like they do in cattle? And sex sorting semen is something that's really advanced in cattle. Um, so what happens is um, the, um, the X carrying sperm carries um, about 3.8% more DNA than a Y carrying sperm because mostly because of the size of the, of the X chromosome in comparison to the Y chromosome. And so what you do is you dye the sperm um, with, a, with a safe food grade dye and you sort them out so that they're running through a channel, a sperm at a time, and you um, shine a laser on each sperm as it passes through the machine. And if it gives a reflection pattern that indicates that it's an X-carrying sperm, then it's charged and um, it's charged in a, a positive way. And uh, when it passes through an electric field, it's deflected off to the right. If it's a, if it's a, um, if it's a Y-carrying sperm, uh, sorry, it's the other way around, is it's deflected off to the left. If it's a Y-carrying sperm, then it's charged, the droplet containing the sperm is charged in a positive way and it's deflected off to the right. So we've sorted sperm into whether they're X chromosome carrying or Y chromosome carrying. And we tried that for the first time for a conservation purpose with horses. We picked our stallion and we sorted his semen. And 11 months later, with all fingers crossed, because the success rate of sorting those sperm is around about um, 96%. So we knew there was always that chance that even after all of this time, we would end up with, um, with a cold foal. And that was really what we didn't want um, because we were being followed by the media and the press and all sorts of things. And, um, in July last year, uh, Ruby gave birth. And I'll spare you the gore, and, um, and we'll click to this slide. This is a foal born from a suffer punch for sex scene, and this breed is on the brink of extinction. And this is one way that we maybe can save breeds from going extinct, especially something like the suffer punch by having a sex fall. So she luckily she came out as a filly and 72 females left in the UK. It's about 300 in the world. And something like this can make all the difference if we can use sex seed as just one of the tools in our box to stop these just amazing, amazing animals from going extinct. And it's great that she's a female because she can carry on breeding now and hope for the future. So that's Mare and Foal, Ruby on the right with me, and uh, Hope, we've, we've named the foal Hope, with Tullis on, on the left, um, and hopefully she's the start of, of the future. This has got a lot of press coverage, the Suffolk Horse Society now interested in this even more, along with another, a number of other breeds, so the publicity's really helped, um, and more horses are being bred in this way, so we're really using this technology now to um, to increase the female population in a genetically appropriate way for the future. But what about the applications? This is just a, this is a rare breed of horse. What about the future? Well, 
all other endangered breeds are starting to gather detailed pedigrees, whether they're in zoos or in managed populations in the wild, we now have better records of which, which individuals being bred with which. But also most domestic breeds also have pedigrees, whether they're healthy at the moment or not. And I've, I've just highlighted here a, a scientific publication, a recent one, looking at the thoroughbred horse. Remember, thoroughbreds, when they're bred together, are effectively like breeding cousins together. And there's um, an indication that that's now affecting the performance of the thoroughbred. They're, they're being inbred. And, and the thoroughbred uh, breeders ought to be interested in this technology because if we can analyze their pedigree and they've got a fantastically well detailed pedigree, if we can analyze that, we can inform mare breeders about which stallions they should be using to maintain the genetic health of that population. Uh, Gareth, I'm ever so sorry. I will have to break in there now because um, the event actually was due to finish. Oh, right. OK, I'm ever so sorry anyway, but I've had a message um, that we really need to draw to a close. So um, can't thank you enough. And actually seeing the, the video of um, Ruby giving birth was um, so... Um, delightful and um, all the explanation you gave I think will be much appreciated by the many scores that I've noticed have come online today. So um, although we haven't got time to um, take questions, can I just say to everybody, if you would like questions passed on to Gareth, you can do that um, by emailing me at eastmidlands at rsb.org.au UK and I'm sure you'll um, get responses um, from anything that I forward to you. So many, many thanks from the East Midlands Committee. Um, we really have appreciated your time and just telling us about what was basically a world beating story. I remember seeing it in the media and uh, in papers on the television and it really is um, something that holds out hope for the future to help with other rare breeds. Yep. So thank you very much, but I can already see people having left. So um, I'm, I must leave it at that. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you very much. I've left a QR code on the, on the thank you slide. So people can get in touch. Yes, that's brilliant. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you.